Okay, so welcome back. This is part two of a series of presentations on Riemann's treatment of abelian functions. We went through last time some of the differences between qualitative and quantitative measurements as we'd see them in economy and in biology. Today we're going to look at that a little bit more with the idea of getting into the connectedness of Riemann surfaces and how that applies in economics. So to start with, uh, let's take a look again at the heuristic model we've been using a lot of the different kinds of changes uh, is in the development of life over evolutionary time. But here let's take that concept of qualitative and quantitative changes. Let's look at it again from the standpoint of quantitative and as we're going to see topological changes. So for example we've seen in life things like if you compare the difference between cells getting larger or cells getting more complex and then having multicellular life beginning with colonial organisms or, or aggregations of cells where they're all exactly the same to the development of tissues. That's an interaction between cells that you don't have in unicellular life. There is a connection between them that simply didn't exist before. If you take another example, you may be a, uh, you know, developing better skills as a predator. I don't know, sharper fangs, sharper teeth, something like this. You compare that with the different kinds of symbioses that you get where organisms rely on each other in a different way than the predator-prey model. Where if you take the case of endosymbiosis, which is the idea that um, when you've got chloroplasts and plants, these were actually originally independent unicellular organisms that now live inside the plant cells, or mitochondria inside the cells of animals. That's a kind of connection where it's best described not as a numerical relationship, but it is a topological one, as we'll see, as a connection between life. Another example would be the development of eggs and seeds. This was a huge breakthrough, as we discuss all over the website, of the ability to conquer land by having eggs, which are, don't require water, uh, you know, tough eggs, and then seeds, which don't require water, as, uh, as previous plants had done. Compare that with you know, multi-species reproduction, what does that mean? Think about when more than one species is required to achieve reproduction. So if you think about parasites, for example, where you get different kinds of tapeworms or trichinella, things like this, where for this species to go about its life cycle, it has to live in both, let's say, or malaria, a human being and a mosquito. Or with some of those other diseases, a human being and a cow or a pig. Or if you take uh, the example of bees and flowers. Now, you know, moving towards seas, that's a big development. Moving towards angiosperms, that's a big development, too. You're not providing fruit. It's an upshift in the environment, in the biosphere as a whole. But it's a lot easier for um, conifers to get it on with each other. You know, when a, you know, one pine tree just shoots some pollen out and it, you know, lands on the other uh, pine tree. But imagine if you've got to have bees involved. So now even the simple act of having sex, you have to have another species involved in it. It's a different kind of connection. Let's take a look at a couple of, a couple of, uh, usually, it, yeah, it doesn't happen with the, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's, uh, yeah. Take a look at economic changes, too. For example, you might say, well, are the factories being more productive? Are they, or do they have a better management system? Are people working harder? Okay, that's one thing. But now think about the other major point about the infrastructure that a factory d exists in. When you develop railroads inside the United States, you're able to then allow for more specialized production, where you can actually move parts of semi-finished goods between a number of different production sites in a way that's efficient enough that they can specialize and you can still get a finished product done in a way that just simply wouldn't be possible without that easy transportation, at least not available over a, the large area that railroads made possible. Or if you think about uh, you know, the change from belt-driven factories where all the, the whole factory would be powered by, say, a, a steam engine, uh, which would spin a large axle along the roof, and then leather belts would come down to the individual machine tools. Changing that to electric motors, that's a major shift. Think about some of this. It's a little bit hard to decide what category they go in, to be honest. But if you want to definitely think about something that's topological in a specifically non-quantitative way, think about, say, the Grand Coulee Dam. You know, it's, it's said that the incredibly cheap electricity provided by the dam was a big reason for the siting of aerospace industry there, because making aluminum takes a huge amount of electricity. You know, before the electrical means of, of separating out aluminum were developed, it was one of the most expensive materials known to mankind. More, more priceful, it, it cost more than gold. 
the, uh, the top of the Washington Monument was domed with the most precious metal people could think of, aluminum. <laughs> this is when only chemical means were available for producing it, which is really hard. With electricity, it's very easy, but it uses a ton of power. So if you've got plenty of cheap hydropower, hey, a great place to start making some aluminum. So let's, uh, I want to use this quote from, this is a quote from Lynn on this subject. He wrote in his excellent paper, Science, the Power to Prosper, from 2005, that the understanding of this point which I am developing here enables us to understand why the transfer of production of a product, even when the same technology of design and production is employed, from a developed economy to a less developed economy has usually resulted during the recent quarter century in a net collapse of the level of the rate of generation of per capita productivity in the world as a whole. The transfer of production from a nation with advanced development of its infrastructure to a nation of relatively poor people with a poor development of general infrastructure tends to produce a collapse of the physical economy of the planet as a whole. The role of the field represented by basic economic infrastructure has been ignored with what must tend to become ultimately fatal economic results for all concerned. So this is in the discussion of, of outsourcing. You say, oh, you know, it's much cheaper. You know, why, why, do, why do companies move a factory overseas to China, for example? It's not because the workers are so much better. It's because it's just simply they're paid less. You know, it's a pure monetary profit, not a physical one. If you look at the number of man hours that are involved in transporting uh, different goods, if you've got less efficient power plants, the amount of actual time and human effort involved in producing electricity for those plants, it's actually less effective when you've got less infrastructure, even if you make more money financially. So, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at some different kinds of um, changes of magnitude. I actually need a, uh, I'm going to need a, uh, a volunteer in a minute for this. But let's take a look at the way we can work with numbers. So, for example, here we've got two numbers, 2 and 18. What number goes in the middle? Ten. Ten? Okay, that's one. Any, any other number that might fit in the middle? Hmm. Why, why six? I've heard a few sixes. Geometric, right? So we got two different ways of moving from one number to another. Ten is in the middle because by adding. From two to ten, we added eight. From ten to eighteen, we added eight. Six is in the middle by multiplying. From two to six, we multiplied by three. From six to eighteen, we multiplied by three again. So something's in the middle depending on what your means are. So if you think about the word means, you know, it's a... It's a word that has a couple of different meanings, right? By the means by which you get something, you know, if we, we use um, the word medium in a similar way. The medium by which you convey something, you know, means are like that. Now, I want to, uh, I want to test this out with, uh, with these jars here. Now, I got a jar here. Everybody can see. It's clear. It's a couple of balls in it. Oh, maybe to add another one. Would anybody like to add two balls to this jar. Is this, come on up. This is, this is, it's going to get tougher, okay? You, get, you got the easy one. <laughs> All right. Everybody agree? All right. Thank you very much. Now, <laughs> Would anybody like to double the number of balls in the jar? Or say how many balls to add? All right, great. <laughs> yep. Uh huh. If anybody said, did anybody agree with that? Can people see how many balls she added? Looks like there's uh, Yep. Yeah, there's 10 now. Okay. Great. Now I've got another jar. Would anybody like to add two balls to this jar? 
<laughs> okay, you know what? This one's pretty easy. I'll just go ahead and do it, okay? Okay, now can I get a volunteer to double the number of bar balls in this jar? Or tell me what I, how many I ought to add. I, I'll do it for you, actually. How, how many should I put in it? I'll give you a hint. It wasn't empty before. Hmm. We're going to do it by sound. I'll add two. Yeah, I don't know if that's double or not. I don't think so. Yeah. Well, I think we could be here all night and no one's going to do it because you can't tell. if You have to know how many are in there to double it. So that's the difference in these two different kinds of change. When you're adding, you don't need to know what something already is. When you're multiplying, you do. You need to have a context uh, when you're multiplying. So, oops. Hmm. Oh, yeah, that was the physical challenge. Okay. So now I want to compare uh, two different concepts. People heard of scalar and vector. Let's take a look at the word vector. Out, even outside of a mathematical context, what, what does the word vector mean? Direction. Direction. Any other ways it's used? Motion. Motion. I know from things that you can make big without losing resolution. Oh, vector graphics. Okay. How about in biology? Like a pathway. A pathway. Well, in biology. It's a means by which, you know, you might say that a mosquito is a vector for malaria. Right? It's a means by which you, vector, uh, malaria moves around. Mm -hmm. And still got that idea of moving or, or changing. The uh, vector graphics might stand out in this example a little bit, but that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, you know, so a vector, a vector tells you where you're going. Now, I want to, we're going to get at the difference between scalars. Now, is that a familiar word to anybody? Yeah. What does scalar mean? A magnitude. A magnitude. Okay. Let me ask a few questions here. Now, these are going to get harder, like last time. So A and B, which one's a bigger magnitude? OK. B. I think, let me, let's, yeah, that's right. OK. How about here? A or B, which one's bigger? B. All right. OK. How about now? Same. <laughs> They're the same? A. A is bigger? How about now? <laughs> All right, this is kind of a tough one. I swear these lines are straight now. So you can see B is a little bit bigger. Wow. Okay, that was kind of sneaky. How about this one? <laughs> Which one's bigger? Hard to tell. Are they the same? They're not, if, you can't say which one's bigger, but they're definitely not the same, right? I mean, is anyone confused about if I remove the labels, would it be hard to remember which one was A and which one was B? Is there, there's a certain difference between them, right, that's pretty clear? Yes, yeah, so they're definitely oriented differently. Right, they're definitely pointed in different directions. So let's, uh, let's move over to the whiteboard. Let's take a look at what it, if we expand the idea of number or magnitude to include direction as well as just size. Let's see what happens. Let's take, a look at, uh, let's take a look at adding some different numbers here. So first off, I'm going to actually give them a direction too, not just an orientation. Let's say here's our A that we had before. And let's say this is B. Anybody have a hunch of what we'd do to add A and B? Okay, so put B's tail at A and then draw the line connecting them. Seem pretty good? Mm -hmm. People nodding. Any other ideas? I mean, if you're following directions on a map and you're going to go east and then northeast, you know where you're going to wind up. You just do, you just do the two motions. Let me ask this. Usually, if I had just normal numbers, if I had 2 plus 3, is that different than 3 plus 2? No. 
Let's see what happens if I, what if I add b plus a? So here's b. You know what, I think I'll keep b red. So here's b. And then add a. No, same thing, a plus b, b plus a, no really big difference there. Let's take a look at multiplying though. Because as we saw with, the, uh, with the, the jars, you have to know what something is already to multiply it. Another way of, another way of putting that is that, um, here, let's, let's take a look at multiplying just with lines. If I want to multiply this length by this length, how could I do it? What's the product? The rectangle. Rectangle. Let's try that. So here's A. And here's B. So then the, the product would be an area rather than a length. Okay, what if I want to multiply it by C? What, what do I do? Multiply off the board. Come off the board? Okay. So now this volume would be the product, right? Now if I'm just multiplying normal numbers, 2 times 3 times 4, there's no harm in me multiplying that by 5, right? That's allowed? So what if I take these lengths, A times B times C, what if I want to multiply it by D? <laughs> Seems harder? Need another dimension. Need another dimension. Right, so you just draw in another dimension. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of tough. Okay. Maybe there's another way, hold on, let's, let's, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to just A times B. Let's see if we can work with this rectangle somehow. Um, what if we pulled out a, a ruler? And what if we measured A and B and we found out that A was exactly 2 inches and B was 3 inches? Then we could say that the product was 6 square inches, right? So, but to do that, we had to introduce this new length, 1. And then we could say that the product, 6, we express the product in terms of the original length, we can actually write out 6 as just a line. And then we could multiply it by C and D, and we wouldn't have to worry about running out of dimensions. But what if I didn't use inches? What if I used centimeters? What if I used half inches? That'll work out nicer. So let's say I'm going to do them again. I'm going to use a different ruler where I'm measuring everything by half inches. And that's my one, one half of an inch. Mm -hmm. right. Well, how long is A now? Four. Here's B. It's not, it's not three anymore. It's now six. And then the rectangle that we're going to make when we put it all together, how many square half Cs will it be? 24. Okay, so let's make 24. So 6, 12, 18, 24. So you can see when we used, if we tried to take away the area or the volume or whatnot and just look at lengths, when we used a different idea of what 1 was, the product really changed. So there's just really no way of saying what the product is without an idea of what 1 is. Because you have to look at each number as itself a product. A is A times 1. Another way of looking at that, and then we'll, we're going we're to look at it with the, the directional numbers. Let's take a look at these, uh, let's take a look at a few numbers here. Let's take, we can use 1, 2, 3, and 6. Now, again, the order of multiplying shouldn't matter, right? One, so two times three is six. Three times two is six. Look at it this way. One is to two, as three is to what? One is to three, as two is to six. Right? 
So one is to one number as the other number is to the product. Let's try that idea with numbers where the direction matters and not just the size. Okay, so yeah, we got that. So first I'm going to have to make a 1 if I want to multiply anything. So let me start by doing that. The 1 will have to, I guess it has a direction and a length. I'm going to be boring and I'll say 1 points to the right. There's 1. So now A, instead of just being a number, it's an actual motion. Here's A. And here's B. So again, using that idea, 1 is to 2 is 3 is to 6. 1 is to A as B is to, is to what? Let's take a look at a quick video of that. So we can use a triangle to represent the ratio between 1 and a. It gives you an idea of the different lengths and the angles. If we take a similar triangle, internally it'll have the same relationships. Now we can create this product up here, a, b. It is to b as a was to 1. Right. So in that way it's the product. So just to draw it here again, 1 is to A, let me make it green. Because yeah. the triangle, the lengths have different sides. They, the sides have different lengths and it has angles. So if I drew that same kind of triangle on B, right, here's A times B. If I did it the other way, if I said 1 is to B, so it starts to get messy. 1 is to b as believe this triangle is similar too. So 1 has the same relationship to b as a does to the product. So that's an idea of multiplying. So taking into account both numbers and also uh, what your 1 is. So I want to go ahead and do something new now. Let's take a look at a specific kind of multiplying. Let's look at squaring, which is where you multiply something by itself. That comes from squares, which is why it has the name. You know, if you had a, you know, if you have a normal size square, if you make a larger square, well, the side that you increased the length by, if you doubled it, you doubled it two times. You doubled the width, you doubled the height. So squaring, multiplying by itself. Let's take a look at a, a particular kind of number. I'm going to call it e. I want to look at e squared. So does anybody have an idea? Here's our triangle. 1 is to e, as e is to what? Anybody want to try drawing it or describing it? Yeah, e times e. So you have to have some kind of way of multiplying e by itself. Right. And it seems like right now we found a way to multiply e by 1. Mm -hmm. Remember, so we did 1 is to a. Then we started at b and did the same kind of change that got us from 1 to a. If we took, take a look at multiplying 2 times 3, 2, we got there by doubling 1. If you do the same thing with 3, you get 6. However, we got to e from 1, what happens if we do that to e? Can you just create a right angle to e in that hypotenuse? Mm hmm. 
Yeah, so now, now e is like our 1. So we're going to do a, a similar thing here. 1 is to e. If e was 1. Right? 1 is to e, and then this is e's e. This is applying the change of going from 1 to e and applying it to e. So this over here is e squared. Does that work? Yep. Is there another name we might give that look that direction? Negative one. I think that's a good name. This is one. This is a negative one. So it looks like this e number squared is negative one. So e is the number that times itself is negative one. That means it's the square root of negative 1. Just like here, this whole square is 4. The root of a square, you might say, is its side, because it's what makes the square. So here, the square, the root of the square of 4 is 2. Here, the root of the square of negative 1 is e. So this is a new kind of number. It's the most opposite number to the normal number line. And we could have gone 1, 2, 3, 4. We could have gone negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. This exact, completely contrary direction, we got this uh, e, or we could call it, uh, some people like to call it i. You've probably, it's the number, that's what you most often see it as. People say i is the square root of negative 1. And they say it's just imaginary, because you can't make a square whose area is negative 1, can you? And you can't draw a square and then it just vanishes into a vacuum. So what we're going to do is, this is called, uh, these are called complex numbers. The, wor the words complex and simple are, are antonyms. So something simple, it's not complex. So complex just means it's not a simple number. The way it's not simple is that it's not on the number line, but it's on a number plane. Now you could also ask, what if I put numbers in space instead of just on a plane? And that's a great question, but we're not going to do that tonight. <laughs> we're we're going to look at complex numbers now and start getting into how Riemann looked at complex functions, not as mathematical, but as physical things, and then why he had to use his surfaces uh, named after him to understand them. So let's get into that. Let's start taking a look at, um, let's take a look at, let's, let's stick with squaring. And now I'm kind of going to jump, jump to the end a little bit here. Good job. Yeah, we're going to do the complex plane. Okay, so this is a. Uh, this is something we, some of you might remember. This we did this here a few months ago. Just to kind of cut to the chase on it, um, I'm going to show an image of when it's completed. But what we had done, and what's an excellent thing to do, is to go ahead and take take a small region of this number plane. So here's the number 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2. Let's just start saying i, i, 2i. What's this spot right here called? Remember, this is 1, and this is i. Mm -hmm. We said 2 plus i? Mm -hmm. All right. Remember the way of adding things. You just do them. 2 plus i. We could call that 2 plus i. What if we wanted to square that number? Well, we could do it. We could say that 1 is to 2 plus i as, we need to make the grid a little bit bigger. One is to two plus i is two plus i, so we'll do that once, twice, i times in its frame of reference. Mm -hmm. If two plus i were just one, and we drew a whole orange grid like this, this would be its two plus i. 
So in the blank terms of reference, this is 2 plus i squared up there. So this number, when we squared it, we got up here. Now what I'm going to take a look at is we're going to take a look, we're going to walk around the complex plane, and we're going to keep taking every number and we're going to square it, and we're going to see what we get. So let's do that here. Let me play this one again. So let's do a little bit of explanation on that. So here, for example, this is 1. If you square 1, you get 1, right? Let's just do a couple of examples on it. What's this point right here? Oh, here the grid is, is by halves. Right? This is a half. This is 1. What's this point? 1 plus i. What do we get if we square 1 plus i, if we do that motion to itself? Two i. Let's do it on the board here. Make sure we get it. So here's, here's our start. Here's one. Here's one plus i. So we can do our uh, do the relationship again. So one is to one plus i as one plus i is to this spot right here, which is, yeah, it's 2i. It's up 2. So again, the number 1 plus i, you could think of it as go straight ahead, turn left, and drive the same amount. That is an idea. If you did that to itself, if you drove straight to that point, then took a left and drove that same amount, you'd get here. Another way of thinking about it. So the square is 2i. Two, two so let's take, a look at, uh, let's take a look at this squaring animation again. Let's see what happens when we get here. Indeed, we're at 2i. So there's a funny thing that happens. When we get over here to negative 1, negative 1 squared is just 1. So we're actually making this, uh, making this, this shape twice here. Another thing that means is that if you picked a point on this drawing and said, I want to go back to the point that made it on the left, is there any trouble in doing that? What's the trouble? Let me ask about this number. Let's take a look over here at negative 1 minus i. It's exactly opposite 1 plus i. Let's take a look at squaring that. Let me use green. So 1 is to negative 1 minus i. It gets kind of harder to draw now. As negative 1 minus i is to the same 2i. So each position actually would go back to two different spots. It would have to split itself. Right. If you said, what's the square root of 2i, or what number squared gives me 2i, you could say, well, it was 1 plus i, or maybe it was minus 1 minus i. I can't really tell you. Oh, yeah. It's just like if you said, what's the, uh, I said, I'm thinking of a number. I've got some number. And if I multiply it by itself, I get 1. What number am I thinking of? I say, well, you're probably thinking of 1, but is there another option? Negative. Negative 1. Right. Negative 1 is like a U-turn. If you turn around, if you do two U-turns, you're facing in the same direction again. 
So 1 times 1 is 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is also 1. So you can't really go backwards in an unequivocal way. Once you've squared a number, you've sort of lost something about what your original number was. So this was a big trouble because you know sometimes the, the opposite of squaring, square rooting, has two answers for every question that you might ask, except for the point zero, which only has zero as its answer. There's some questions you can ask where there's not just two, but an infinite number of answers that are all right. Can anybody? Well, let's come back to that. <laughs> let's stick with this one for now. I want to take a look at this now with uh, using Riemann's surface approach to see how he, he cleared this thing up here. So let's start. We're going to focus in on, the, uh, on just the squaring. Hmm. There we go. And then now, don't get dizzy. Riemann said, "Look at it like this. It wasn't really on. It wasn't really on a plane. It was actually on two sheets. So that as you were moving around, you really weren't crossing your own steps again. You weren't really covering the same path twice. The oh. let's watch that. When you were moving around, squaring all the numbers that existed on that uh, on that original square." You're actually going on both sheets. Right. Let's take a look at them uh, side by side. So once, once you've picked which sheet you're on, say, uh, say let's say we're here, we're giving you the normal the, no, the number you most might expect to be the square root, like the number 1 instead of negative 1. As long as you're moving smoothly and you keep getting your neighboring square root, there's no ambiguity. Yet, by the time you've come all the way around, the numbers are all different. So in other words, it depends on how you got to a, a, got to a number that you're going to take the square root of. Here's another way of looking at that, of taking what was, a, what was just a, a plane we were looking at and seeing that you know, it, actually, it actually had two, uh, two layers. Can anybody think of a question where there's, not, where there's more than two answers? Well, okay, I mean, uh, kind of a math type question, not just any question, yeah. <laughs> a little more specific, yeah. Fourth roots. Fourth roots. Maybe four answers. How about if, uh, how about this? Okay, I'm thinking, oh, hold on, I'm going to think of one right now. I'm going to think of a, uh, I'm going to think of an angle. Okay, I got, I got a good one. I'm thinking of an angle right now. And the sine of this angle, let's go over what a sine is. If I'm moving around on a circle, it makes a lot of sense to measure the motion, not in terms of the, like the 1 and the i that we were using, or an x and a y. It makes sense to measure it in terms of rotation, of angle, or maybe by measuring the, the amount of this circular road that you've driven on. What you can do, though, to c go between the circular way of looking at things and then this, uh, this way of looking at things is for a certain spot corresponding to a certain angle that you've gone, you can say that that spot has a cosine and a sine. It's just the height and then the, the how far to the right you'd have to go to get to it. So I'm thinking of a, an angle where the sine is 0. Anybody know what angle I'm thinking of? Which one? 
There's a move that gave us two answers. What, what's one answer? 180. I wasn't thinking of zero or 180. No. Nope. <laughs> nope. So here's zero degrees. Here's 180. Here's 360. Nope. Sorry. 520? 520 would be about here. Oh, sorry. I wasn't thinking of 540 either, though. <laughs> nope. Anyway, we could, I mean, I don't know if anything that fun is going to happen when you guess the number. <laughs> it was 900. Whoa. Okay. You know, so that's a question, though, where there's just, it's just when you're, when you're taking angles and you're turning them into just these, these heights, these signs, you can't go backwards anymore. There's actually an infinite number of sheets. And the Riemann surface for the, uh, for the inverse sign has an infinite number of sheets. I don't have a picture of that tonight, though. <laughs> I do just want to want to make this sort of a, a, a brief intro. What I want to do in the next couple of ones is get into more detail about how these surfaces work. So for that, we're just going to look generally into surfaces. How do you distinguish one kind of surface from another? So with surfaces, there's a lot of things about them that don't involve numbers in the quantitative way that you might think of a number. For example, if you had a... Uh, this is a common one people talk about when they're talking about surfaces. They say if I had a, a teacup, a coffee mug, that that coffee mug, if I just sort of bent it and remolded it smoothly, I could turn it into a donut. Because either way, it's just got one hole in it. So they say, well, that, that's something about it, you know. That's something about the surface. Where it's not really about lengths on it, but it's about the kinds of different kinds of actions that you can do on it. For example, if you have a torus, if you're careful with it, you can take an X-Acto knife, just the outside surface of a torus, nothing in the middle. Like if you ordered just the icing that would have been on a donut. And you slit it here, and then you slit it here also, in those two different ways. You would unfold it and have a rectangular piece of icing, but it would still be one piece of icing. If I took a, uh, something simpler, if I just took a piece of paper, there's no way you can make a cut across the whole thing and not have two different pieces of paper. Right? If you cut a piece of paper like that, you're going to have two pieces of paper. If you cut a curve inside the paper, you're going to have two pieces of paper. So already that's just a real big difference between the torus and the piece of paper. It, it's a different kind of difference than, say, if you measured how long it was or anything like that. You know. That's the kind of differences that Riemann gets into. We're going to see when we get into higher kinds of functions, starting with things like the sine and cosine, where there's an infinite number of answers. So that's some of the, we're going to look at some of that general topology stuff, and then we're going to get into the specifics of, of abelian functions and higher functions, of how Riemann treated these things. I think what we had seen before in some earlier work we'd done on Dirichlet's principle, where if you know the boundaries, you can find out what's going on inside. Now we're going to add in the other aspect, which is how do you deal with singularities or points where something unusual happens, like the point zero in square root. Point zero is fine, but as you walk around it, you end up, having, you end up finding that there's two different sheets. If I just walked around here, nothing unusual would happen. I would keep getting the same answer again and again. It's not like this one where... It seems like when I come back to the same point, when I looked at it just as a flat plan, I got a different answer. So that's what's coming up. This is just going to be a, this is a quick introduction to complex functions and Riemann surfaces. So let's see where there, I bet there might be some questions, though. I saw some faces. <laughs>